Well, good morning, North Phoenix Church. Greetings, greetings, and salutations. Pastor Noe has asked me to preach today, and I said, well, I had a real deep spiritual question for him. I said, what do you want me to wear? <laughs> and so he loaned me a pair of his summer white preaching shoes. <laughs> Check it out. Eat your heart out, Michael Jordan. <laughs> well, we've just finished an incredible study by Pastor Noe and Pastor Davis from Habakkuk. And we spent six weeks. Have you ever wondered why we'd spend so much time in an Old Testament book? Well, simple question, uh, answer is, it is the Word of God. It's an amazing library that God has given to us of 39 Old Testament books, all pointing to His ultimate plan to send His Son to be with us. 27 books in the New Testament, all sharing how we can know Christ and walk with Him deeper and daily. For Jesus, for God's Word, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God's Word will stand for all time. Paul says, all Scripture, all Scripture, Old Testament and New, is God-breathed. In its inspired voice, we hear useful teaching, we hear rebuke, correction, instruction, and training for life that is right so that God's people may be up to the task and have all they need to accomplish every good work. It's an amazing book. Sir Francis Bacon was a 15th century a philosopher and politician. And he said that some books are to be tasted, some books are to be chewed, and others are to be thoroughly digested. Come and taste the goodness of the Lord. Chew, meditate on His Word day and night. Digest it, for in times of temptation, God's Word will help you resist. In times of sorrow, God's Word will comfort. In times of incredible decision-making, God will be your counselor, for His Word is a lamp, a light unto my feet. Now, Marcia and I have different approaches to the morning. Um, <laughs> men are from Mars, women are from Venus. <laughs> Far as east is from the west. Alexa, uh, set the alarm for 6 a.m. to Reveille. And when that alarm goes off, that bugle is blowing, I fly out of bed. Before my heat feet touch the ground, I'm already saying, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And then I start going into the kitchen, and as I'm leaving, I hear Marcia say, Lexa, turn that blastic music off. <laughs> she likes a calmer, slower, methodical approach to the morning. And so I go into the kitchen and put on the kettle and make her a cup of tea. And if she's really been nice, I'll put a biscotti on the saucer. <laughs> and by the time I'm done preparing everything, uh, she has already moved from the bedroom out into the sunroom, watching the sunrise, listening to the birds cheep, checking out the garden, and, and I come in with a tea and biscotti, Your Majesty. <laughs> now, if I've thrown some of you husbands under the bus, I uh, deal, deal with it. So I go back into the kitchen, 
and I just need a whole lot stronger drink. And so I go in there and I pull me a double shot of espresso. And then I go into the library. And I sit in there, I'm surrounded by all these books, you know, Bibles and Bible commentaries, church history, philosophy. And then over here in this side, I have a section just dedicated all to uh, Daniel Silva, <laughs> novels. Got to keep it real. And so you'd probably say, well, what book would I pull out and look at first thing in the morning? My iPhone. <laughs> it comes on. I hit the news app. And I read, oh, the stock market. It's all in red today. The war in Ukraine. About the famines in Africa. New diseases coming out of China and the partisanship in Washington. And after I've been reading for about an hour, I am thoroughly depressed. <laughs> Marsh is in the sunroom reading the good news. I'm in the library reading the bad news. Now, I've confessed this to our home group. And they say, Steve, why do you do that? Why do you start your day off in that way? My name is Stephen Hayes, and I'm a news junkie. <laughs> Sounds like I'm at an AA meeting. My time is more in the evening, at night. Those chirping birds are no longer squawking. <laughs> They're in roost. Nobody's mowing the grass, blowing the leaves. I don't hear any sounds of traffic. And, and I may listen to, watch a few innings of D-back baseball, but then I'm ready to pop my headphones on and, and just tune out to Christian tunes. And just listen to music. Christian music for maybe 30 minutes, an hour, two hours. It just fills me, and then I'm ready. I'm ready to see what God has to say to me through His Word. What's great about the Old Testament is you can just kind of read narratively, and then you get into the poetry and it's a little harder. And then you get into the Old Testament about Paul, and sometimes I can only read a couple of sentences and I'm trying to figure out everything he's having to say. And then I crawl into bed at night and just lay there and just begin to praise God from the songs I've been listening to. Thank Him for what He said to me in His Word, who He is, what He's done, what He's doing, what He's going to do, His promises. Pray for friends and family. Just kind of raise my hand over Marcia and pray for her while she's sleeping. And I just encourage you, carve out time and space to be with God in your day. Oh, our lives are busy, unbelievably busy. Carve out a time, dedicate a space. For when God speaks to you, it happens. God's Word, it's a power. It's like, it's not like God's Word is our Word. When we say something, we have to do it. But God's Word is His active power. Let there be light. When you hear God speaking to you in His Word, when you study His Word, when you hear His voice speaking to you in His Word, that is His power coming into you. That is His reality coming into your life. And if you want to make sure your prayer life is meaningful and deep, study the Word of God. God is speaking to you. And then we have the opportunity to respond. So let us respond in what we've heard from the Word this morning. Let's do so in prayer. Blessed is the man 
who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. For his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of living water that brings forth fruit and its fruit in season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does prospers. The ungodly are not so. They are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. O God, grant that we may delight in your word, your life-giving word. May we meditate on it day and night. Show us the inestimable value of the Bible. For it is the power of your word that leads us to, as sinners to, to salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Today our text is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 3. And Paul is going to introduce us to, to some, some characters. But let's just read the scripture first. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it, and indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? Every day of your life has the potential to be an exciting adventure with God. But it all depends on who your traveling companion is and, to some extent, your destination. Where are you going? Who are you traveling with? For the Christian, the Christ follower, this adventure has to be fueled by the Holy Spirit, fueled in knowing His reality, fueled in being filled with His Spirit so that we can constantly moment by moment, under His gracious direction in our lives, walk. And the adventure is just to be with God, to be with God on mission, to see what God is up to and to join Him, and He invites us to follow Him by filling us with His Spirit. He actively leads the way to our destination for His glory, for His purposes. It's not about you, not about your pleasures, it's not about your happiness or your purpose. It's all about God. It's all about God. For His Word is a lamp unto our feet, and a light unto our path. So Paul has introduced us to three characters from that passage of Scripture. And the first one he refers to is the natural man. The natural man is a self-directed life, someone who's not received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You may have seen uh, this illustration, but not like this before. This is an original watercolor by a local artist. And I'll be out in the lobby selling these. <laughs> I mean, you laugh. But, you know, great artists are usually not recognized till after they die. So get one quick. So the natural man. Look at this guy. He's on the throne. He's directing his own decisions and actions. Christ isn't in his life. The sphere of his life just seems to be, well, it looks like an amoeba to me. Just kind of wobbly. Uh, 
He's on the throne of his life. He, look at the fine detail of that color, watercolor. His face is red. His hair's on fire. He's mad. He's frustrated. He's angry. He's trying to call the shots in his life, and that's what those little blobs mean, finances and recreation and marriage, schooling. But Christ is outside his life. This is a self directed life. And the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him. And he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised." Now, in contrast, Paul talks about the spiritual man, or the spiritual person. This is the Spirit-directed life, and you can see the difference immediately one who is empowered by the Holy Spirit. So, in the sphere of his life, there is that throne, same throne, but uh, Jesus is no longer outside his life. He's invited Christ to come into his life, to be on the, the throne of his life, to control his life, to give him direction for his finances, his relationships, any kind of decision-making. And he has voluntarily stepped off the throne and is giving glory to Jesus. Now, I like this guy's face because it's a little bit more, has the idea of life, green. And, and what is he doing? He's pointing just like the basketball stars who point to each other when somebody gives them an assist. They give them the glory, all the credit to Jesus. This is the, the spiritual man. And he who is spiritual, Paul says, appraises all things. For we have the mind of Christ. The natural man is who we choose to be by nature, by rebellion. Through Adam, sin entered the world, and so death passed to all men because all have sinned. The spiritual man is who God intended us to be. And our identity is rooted in the knowledge that we are creatures who were made by God in dazzling glory, created with an original core of goodness and beauty, and we can live inspired to become God's masterpieces. That's what he intended. We can catch a vision for who we might become in the future so we can begin to live like that person today, a spiritual person. But Paul, talks about another person. And this guy is a Christian. But where is Jesus? Jesus is no longer on the throne of his life. Once again, again he's taking control of his own life. And all of his interests are just spinning around him. There's not a lot of symmetry or balance his finances, his relationship. Christ is still in his life, kind of tucked down there in a corner. And I, brethren, cannot speak to you as spiritual, but as men of flesh, as to be infants. I gave you milk to drink and not solid food, for you are not able to receive it. it e even now, while there is quarreling and jealousy among you, you're not walking, are you not walking like just simply mere men? Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it abundant. This is not his intent, his intent for your Christian life. The fruit of the Spirit is joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. When you trust Jesus... You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Now, now, all Christians are not filled with the Spirit. Someone may say, you know, I, uh, I have one of the fruits of the Spirit. Wait a minute. There is no fruits of the Spirit. It's fruit of the Spirit. That means if you have the Holy Spirit in your life, you have the fruit of the Spirit, it's joy, it's love, it's patience, it's kindness, it's gentleness, it's self-control. And if you say, I don't have any patience, then let God's Holy Spirit fill you, convict you of sin, 
forgive you because he came to give you an abundant life. Don't let Satan rob it. The spiritual person. The spiritual person is what Watchman Nee calls the normal Christian life. That's what God intended for us to live normally. Christ-centered, empowered by His Spirit, sharing our faith with others, introducing friends to Christ, having an effective prayer life, and understanding God's Word to trust God, to obey Him, and to experience all the fruit of the Spirit daily. But why is it that so many Christians are not experiencing an abundant life? Well, the carnal man trust in his own efforts. And the carnal man is what Paul is talking about as this Christian, but he doesn't seem to be a true Christ follower. He's indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but he's not being filled and directed by the Spirit. And he's just simply forgotten God's love. He's forgotten God's forgiveness, God's power. And Jesus said to the church of Laodicea, I know your work. You are neither hot nor cold, but you're lukewarm, and because of that, I will spit you out of my mouth. The carnal person is on a roller coaster ride up and down in his spiritual experience. He can't understand himself. He, he wants to do what is right, but he only does what is wrong. He fails to draw upon the power of the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life. The carnal person's characteristics, his traits of his life, is founded in pride. Pride in unbelief. God, you're not big enough for my situation. You're not big enough to handle my finances, my relationships. Pride. It's in disobedience. God, I'm, in, I'm entitled to this. No, you're not. Poor prayer life, poor Bible study, a legalistic attitude, a critical spirit, saying that you're better than others. Impure thoughts, jealousy and guilt, frustration that leads to aimlessness, that leads to anger. This is all the root of pride. Loss or love for God, for others, no gratitude, lack of service. This diagnosis of this person is very unhealthy. Spiritual health, mental health, emotional health. The carnal Christian has some real issues. The other day I heard a, a rap song by, uh, I know, I must have been on the wrong station. <laughs> but it's by Tony Kay. Tony Kay is a modern day rapper and producer. And He's written a song called Time, and it was featured in a modern film, film saw just recently. But I think he describes a carnal man fairly well in this. I'm not going to sing this or dance to it. <laughs> I don't want to waste more time, time on you. Think I'm going to be just fine without you. Said, I don't want to waste more time, time on you. Think I'm a be just fine without you. Out of sight, out of mind, time to focus on me. Yeah, the ride's been wild, but I'm uh, surviving somehow. Don't want to waste more time, time on you. Think I'll be just fine without you. You, you, you used to be the one I run to, and now you want the one I run from. I don't want to waste more time. Just don't want to waste time on you. Think I'd be fine without you. For this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person. Such a person is an idolater. Has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. No one who is born of God's will continues to sin. 
because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. God wants to give himself away. Throughout history, through all the generations, God wants to give away God. He wants to give away his infinite love, his infinite wisdom. And the vehicle that we can receive that is through the Holy Spirit indwelling and filling our lives. If you've ever ridden the subway in London, uh, it's called the tube, you will uh, have heard the expression, mind the gap. And there's signs everywhere. You're going down the escalator, and it says, watch your purse. Thieves are around, but it always says, mind the gap. And, and the train comes up to the platform. And as the doors open, there's this warning, mind the gap. We lived there in London 10 years, and the first time I heard this, I thought that meant step out of the way so that when the doors open, people can get out. But no. When that door opens, there is a gap between the platform and where you're going or coming from. Mind the gap. And whenever I would get on or off of the tube, this is what I'd do. <laughs> Mind the gap. Because we need to understand that there is space between us and God. And our natural tendency is to distance ourselves. I don't have time for you today. And we finally begin to isolate ourselves the more and more we get away. Mind the gap. Because God's Holy Spirit fills all the gaps in our lives. And you can appropriate God's Spirit right now and the solution to your problem is simply this. We're going to close here in a moment. I just want to give an invitation to you because if you desire to be filled, directed, empowered by God's Spirit, I'm going to ask you just nobody's looking around. Our heads are bowed. And if this is the desire of your life, Come before Jesus, confess your sins. By faith, thank Him that He has forgiven you of all your sins, past, present, and the future. Because Christ died for you. I implore you to present your every thought captive to Jesus in this moment. Present your body a living sacrifice. And by faith claim the Holy Spirit. God commands it. And whenever God commands something, He gives a promise. This is what He commands. Be filled with the Spirit. Do not be, get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And the promise is that he will always answer when we pray according to his will. This is our confidence, which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, and whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which have been asked from him. So I'm going to give you the chance to express your faith in prayer. How can you be pray? How can you pray in faith to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Just repeat these words after me. God is not concerned, concerned about your words as much as the attitude of your heart. This is your desire. Pray these words. Dear Father, I need you. I acknowledge that I've been directing my own life, that as a result, 
I've sinned against you. I thank you that you have forgiven me of my sins through Christ Jesus. Through his death on the cross for me, I now invite Christ to take his place on the throne of my life again. Fill me with your Holy Spirit as you commanded me to be filled. Fill me with your Holy Spirit as you promised in your word that you would do if I ask in faith. I now thank you for directing my life, for filling me with your Holy Spirit. Amen. Take hope. This message is for Christians. Christian pay. Mind the gap. Be a Christ follower. And not just a Christian in name. Don't dethrone Christ in your life. Be a Christ follower. Be his disciple. And God will empower you to live an abundant life. Now, Lord, may the Lord bless you and keep you this day. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you as you go, as you come. May you walk in the Spirit and just remember the promise. He'll be with you always. God bless. Have a great week, church family.